Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Mark Massa, and I'm the Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry here at Boston College. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome you to our book launch this evening, a book entitled Hope, Promise, Possibility, and Fulfillment, a collection of essays to which 17 of my very smart faculty contributed. That book is, I think, a vibrant witness to the distinguished scholars who work at the STM. It is also a powerful witness to our commitment to the church's mission of hope in the world. We are delighted that you are here with us this evening. I want to publicly acknowledge a number of people without whom this event would not be taking place. I'd like to acknowledge Eric Goldschmidt, who is the director of the church in the 21st century, who co-sponsored this event. I also want to acknowledge and thank Paulist Press and its president and CEO, Mark David Janis, of the Congregation of St. Paul the Apostle. Uh, Mark David is a great friend, an important friend to the SDM. He was planning on being here, but could not be here this evening because of the death of a close friend. And in his stead, Donna Crilly, who is the managing editor of Paulist Press, will say a few words. So please join me in welcoming Donna. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I certainly can't uh, meet the eloquence of, uh, of Father Massa. Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Donna Crilly, and I'm the managing editor at Paulist Press. And as you know, our publisher couldn't be here. He really wanted to be here. He was planning for months to be here, and this, you know, sudden um, death of his friend occurred, and he, he has to, he, it's something he has to do. Um, it's been our pleasure to work with the faculty of Boston College and the School of Theology and Ministry to publish this book. It's been our absolute pleasure. And so tonight we're here to launch that book, Hope, Promise, Possibility, and Fulfillment. So on behalf of Mark David Janis and Paulist Press, and as an alumna of the School of Theology when it was back in Cambridge, um, it is my great pleasure to be here to listen to the insights with you of some of the distinguished authors, Richard Lanon, Nancy Pineda Madrid, Christopher Matthews, and Randy Sachs. I asked her if we were selling a lot of books. She assured me we were. It is also uh, an honor for me to acknowledge and introduce to you a distinguished member of the STM faculty, Dr. Dr. Richard Lanon who had the original idea for this book. Richard is a priest of the Maitland Newcastle Diocese in Australia and is a professor of systematic theology here at the STM. Richard was educated at both Oxford and the University of Innsbruck. Richard is co-editor and contributor to this book. So please join me in welcoming Richard Lennon. Thank you, Mark. And Thank you all for, for being here. I have three delightful tasks this evening. First is to say something about the book. Second, to introduce my colleagues uh, who will be speaking. And third, to make some thank yous. Hope is part of our everyday language. It's not a, a word that's arcane that we have to go check the dictionary to, of course, we've never heard it before. It's also part of our everyday religious language. And yet, probably for most of us, if, if pushed to give a definition of hope, at least prior to this book coming out, uh, <laughs> we'd, we'd struggle to do so. So I think what the book contributes most fully is that it gives you a theological discussion of hope from lots of different perspectives. Uh, the everyday sense of hope is that it has to do both with that the way things are is not terribly good and we'd like them to be better, and with that sense of looking forward to a better world. Hope in that sense is a powerful word. I was struck in the 2008 presidential election by how effective Barack Obama's advertising using that word hope was. He didn't need to explain it, he didn't need to elaborate on it, it simply captured something that at some level 
lots of people could resonate with. What we've attempted to do in this book is to develop uh, as thoroughly as possible a theology of hope, to connect hope to the principal themes of Christian faith, to our understanding of God's revelation, to Christology, to the role of the Holy Spirit, the church, and then most particularly to the everyday living of hope. The beauty of the book, I think, is that it brings together 17 different perspectives, 17 different sets of expertise. Uh, That we could do that without being repetitious uh, is, I think, a tribute to the complexity of the theme. It's a rich theme. It's one that rewards the sorts of exploration that it's found in these authors. I'd like to say something about the evolution of the book because that evolution explains what the finished product looks like. We worked together at two or three meetings about beginning almost two years ago now before anyone wrote a word simply to consider together what we would do with this theme, what each of us might be able to contribute. Then in summer of 2012, everyone wrote their essay And beginning in fall semester last year, we took the whole semester to work and rework the book. We divided into groups of four to review each other's chapters. We then sent the revised chapters to what we called our focus group, a group of six people who read the book for us. In the light of those comments, we did a second draft each. We then went back to our groups of four to revise that second draft And then we finally came up with uh, the version that we sent off to Paulist just before Christmas last year. I think what that process did was enable all of us to work together uh, in a way that we hadn't done before. So it was a very uh, positive uh, event in that way. But it also meant that we developed a consistency of approach throughout the book. And I think that consistency of approach is evident in two things. One is that we have been able to keep working hope around those principal themes of Christian faith, uh, to show its connection, not as a vague notion, but as something that does touch those matters that are at the heart of Christian faith. And the second thing it did was it enabled us to see how hope is not simply about the future, which is often the way that we tend to use it in every day. We hope something will happen tomorrow or next week or next year. What we've been intent on showing is the present effect of hope, how hope makes a difference in our lived present reality. And again and again throughout the 17 chapters, that theme comes through. That consistency of theme was possible because of the work that we did together. And so the first note of thanks that I know Nancy and I would want to make is to the other authors. Uh, The the great enthusiasm that people displayed in working together, their willingness to meet deadlines. If you're going to get 17 people to do something together, you need to be somewhat unforgiving about deadlines. Uh, And yet people were happy enough to meet those deadlines and to remain enthusiastic about the project. And I think that's reflected in our finished product. No matter how good the authors might be, a book goes nowhere without a publisher. So I'm most grateful to Mark David and to Donna particularly for for being here this evening. Uh, From the time I first met with Mark David about 18 months ago until today, our experience with Paulist has been very positive and encouraging. So Donna, uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to you and I know Nancy thanks as well, but also to invite you to pass on that thanks to all your colleagues who are involved in the the production of this book. I mentioned that we had a a focus group to revise, uh, to read and revise the first draft. That was no small effort given that the first draft was somewhat rough in uh, lots of places. So to the members of the focus group who volunteered to read the book for us and then who met with Nancy and I uh, to review it, we're most grateful. To Sarah Atwood, to uh, Gustavo Morello, to Jack O'Brien, to Marina Pastrana, to Jackie Regan and to Jean Pondesoto, all of whom contributed in that way. 
there's one person that I know, Nancy, and I would want to thank most particularly, and that's Kevin Dow sitting right down the back there. Kevin is a doctoral student at the STM, and Kevin contributed as our research assistant for this book. And that meant lots of reading and rereading of drafts to find uh, that almost invisible typo that always exists. But principally, though, it involved doing the index for the book. And to, if you've ever had anything to do with index, you know there's a lot better ways to spend your time. Um, and to do it for 17 authors with multiple references is no small task. Uh, what Kevin added was not just a great skill in so doing, but a real enthusiasm for the fr project. So Kevin, well, it, it owes a lot to you, so thank you for that. Thank you to Melinda for organising this evening. Melinda does everything with great both efficiency and grace, so we're uh, most appreciative of that. We dedicated our book to the students of the STM, as it says, past, present and future. Uh, our students are, for all of us, uh, a source of great encouragement. Uh, and we hope that the book will be, for them, a, a, an equally a source of encouragement. If I tell you how great this book is, I, I can't claim to be impartial. But having read the whole manuscript from cover to cover four times, I can at least claim to speak with the voice of experience. And my experience tells me it's a great book. <laughs> So Christmas is not far away, <laughs> and what better gift to give people for Christmas than hope? We were hoping somebody would ban the book, right? imagining the headline, Bishops Ban Hope. Uh, <laughs> but that would help it sell, but uh, hopefully it will sell on its own merits. It's my pleasure now to introduce our panel for this evening. Nancy Panetta Madrid, who is, of course, the co-editor of the book. Uh, Nancy's essay deals with hope in the face of tragedy. And that theme is a theme that Nancy has made her own in a major study over the last couple of years. Uh, and and it, it's a significant one because, of course, it's tragedy and suffering that so often seem to be destructive of hope. Christopher Matthews, long-time member of the STM faculty, long-time co-editor with our friend Dan Harrington of New Testament Abstracts, writing on hope in Luke's Gospel, and Randy Sachs, equally a long-time member of the faculty who teaches systematics theology. Randy, dealing with hope in the context of what traditionally would have been called eschatology and applied simply to the future. Uh, but what you get in Randy's chapter is a reappropriation of that eschatology as a present reality. So I'm sure they'll all have uh, enlightening things to say to us that will deepen our sense of, uh, of hope and its contribution. So thank you all for being here. Uh, if you'd like to carry away as many coppers as possible, I'm sure Donna won't be uh, upset by that. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Well, I'm delighted to be here as well, and I want to um just tell you how grateful I am for this evening and for seeing this book. Tonight's the first night that I'm seeing this book, so it's quite something. And I, um, Kevin and I were just chatting, and he says, so how do you feel? And I said, it's a bit surreal to see this actually in print. It's, it's really wonderful to be here and to, to celebrate this with you. And I want to begin by just saying a bit about how I came to the project and, um, and start by um, telling a story that is um, really a story of gratitude for Richard. Um, and I imagine a lot of the co-authors here probably don't even know this. But back in January of 2012, I um, knocked on Richard's door and went into his office and I said, now Richard, I, I just want to explore an idea with you. I said, I know you, he'd already launched this idea of a book on hope. And I said, now I know you're, you've got this started and so forth, but I just want to ask if maybe perhaps you might think about having a co-editor with you. And I said, we don't need to really discuss this in any great detail right now. I'm up for review. I don't know what's going to happen. And so let's wait until after, uh, until after the judgment around my tenure is made. And then, then we, can, we can talk about it some more, have further conversations. And I fully expected that this was an open question, right? And so, um, and then come, um, come uh, late March, he has another meeting with all the authors, uh, all the faculty that, that are contributing, 
And, uh, and lo and behold, um, he announces that I'm the co-editor of the book. And I was a little bit, I don't know if I ever mentioned this to, to you, but I was a little surprised because I thought, oh my God, I thought we were going to you know, have further conversations. But much to my joy, it was a great gift to be able to, um, to be the co-editor of this book and to work with Richard. Uh, he's been, it's just been a great gift. Um, I've learned a lot and it's... Um, and I'm just very proud to be associated with this project. Thank you very much, Richard. And I also want to mention as well that it's a, it's a real symbol of the school, which I'm also very grateful for. It's the first time that all of the, uh, of, uh, not all, but most of the faculty at the school come around a particular project of writing. And it's quite stunning uh, to be part of this conversation because you really get a sense of just the richness that's, that's present at the STM. So I'm very grateful to all of my colleagues who participated in this project. Um, as Richard's already mentioned, my chapter is titled Hope and Salvation in the Shadow of Tragedy. And um, tragedy, as we know, has to do with the brute force of, of, of the world as it comes to us often in, in very, very painful ways and, and ways that, that often in our lives create a sense of, of suffering that's prolonged and intense. And I think this is a very, very important question because I don't think anything challenges hope more severely than the presence of prolonged suffering and, and the reality of tragedy in our, in our world. And we all know a number of tragedies, um, certainly at a personal level. I'm sure all of us have experiences in our own families of someone dying when, uh, that, that was unexpected or dying in a way that, that is um, particularly um, terrible. And, um, and, and so there are many experiences personally, but also at a collective level. I was thinking about, uh, as I wrote this, how often we've had experiences of, in, in the last couple of years, the killings that have gone on in this country of um, young people, for example, Sandy Hook Elementary, um, not, uh, not quite a year ago. And then, of course, more recently, Typhoon Haiyan that's been in the news um, over the last week. And uh, closer to home, certainly 9-11 um, and the bombings of um, the marathon bombings here in April of this year. And so the reality of tragedy is certainly in our world and, um, and exists both personally and collectively. And I, I want to share, too, a bit with you about why I chose this topic of tragedy for my chapter in this book. And I, um, to do that, I have to say a little bit about my own history. I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and raised in El Paso, Texas, which is, as you know, right on the U.S.-Mexican border. And as a, as a young person growing up in El Paso, I, uh, I was very much aware of um, just the beauty of the city of Ciudad Juarez. I was often in Juarez for meals and so forth and uh, enjoyed Juarez quite a bit with my family. In 1993, though, um, there was a phenomenon of the killing of women in, in Ciudad Juarez, um, brutal assassinations that have occurred over the last 20 years. Over 600 women have been killed, and most of them are between the ages of 15 and 30. And these killings have gone on with impunity. There has not been justice, although there have been all kinds of court cases and investigations and so forth, but there has been no justice that has come from this. And um, growing up loving this city, the people that were in Juarez, many of whom I knew as close friends, um, gave me all kinds of pause as this tragedy started unfolding over the last 20 years. And it forced me to begin asking, how do we continue to live a life affirming that God wants us to have life abundant in the face of this kind of tragedy? And how do we affirm that life really is a gift and not simply an experience of ongoing pain? And it's out of that experience that I came to, to my chapter. And um, in addition to that, uh, I, I want to share another idea that has been important for me. I think here in the United States that we certainly have, especially through these experiences I just mentioned, a growing sense of tragedy in our own experience here. But as, as, as that's true, I also um, agree with Cornell West. I've read 
some of his work on tragedy, and, and one of the observations he makes is that we don't really deal with the tragic here in the United States in a very substantial way, that we, what he says is that we lack a tragic sensibility, um, that we don't see ourselves so much as a people marked by tragedy. And I, as I reflected on that, I was thinking about um, one tragic event in the last several years, Hurricane Katrina. Um, and, and the fact that the U.S. government, for example, refused international aid when it was offered during that particular tragedy in our country's history. And I think that's an indication, a reflection of what uh, West is trying to get us to think about. And that's not to say that the, there aren't tragedies on our soil. Of course, we could name many of them, the whole phenomenon of slavery and the lynching of blacks, the internment of the Japanese during World War II, the brutal treatment today of undocumented immigrants, and, um, and certainly war veterans of this country know profoundly the experience of tragedy. But that larger, re the, the larger narrative of tragedy still is not fully in, in, in meshed in our consciousness, I, I don't believe. And, um, and so I think that part of my, my own um, interest in this topic is that I, this is an area that we really need to begin thinking about much more seriously, I believe. Um, and, uh, and, and we need to come to terms as we think about that with the fact that we live, of course, in the most powerful country in the world. And in many respects, we live in, in Pharaoh's house. And, um, and by that, I mean that a lot of our decisions that are made in this country um, wreck havoc around the world as well as uh, in our own country. And these can drain us, as we all know, for, uh, from um, having zeal for the gospel and uh, attention to the reign of God in our midst. And, uh, and, and so tragedy forces us to, to really focus on, or invites us, not it doesn't force us, but it certainly invites us to look at this. I believe that theology must walk with those who know tragedy in this world, and that as Christians we have to ask ourselves, how do we practice hope when we face the events that I've just mentioned? And what does it mean to practice hope? And, and, this, and, and tragedy really pushes us to, to the threshold of this question. Um, Simone Weil uh, has written about what she calls affliction, which is an intense kind of suffering, a suffering that is so profound and overwhelming for a prolonged period of time that it actually takes possession of the soul. It takes possession of our soul, and it, and it forces us to think about or invites us to think about uh, what does it mean to, to believe in, um, in a life that is, is abundant? And I think that ma in many respects, um, the kind of intense suffering that, that tragedy inflicts upon us um, invites us to look at, uh, at the question of hope and, uh, and our ability to have an inclination and a promise for the future. The women that I was looking at in Ciudad Juarez are often um, involved in practices in their city where even though they have lost a, 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 a daughter to this tragedy, that they're involved in practices that affirm the possibility of growth and hope for the future. And, um, and, and, that's, and that's what I think that tragedy invites us to think about and to make a choice and a decision for that. And, um, and so that, I just wanted to share tonight with you a little bit about where my own thinking and my work has come from in writing um, this chapter on tragedy and hope. Um, thank you. Well, I uh, echo the comments that have been made so far about uh, how enjoyable it was to work on this project. Uh, and in particular the way the editors set up our working groups um, and uh, uh, I appreciated that experience very much to get to see how others are approaching the topic uh, and compare that with uh, what I was doing. Um, this book gave me an opportunity to uh, set down uh, on paper uh, an interpretation of the works of Luke and Acts that I've been working out in these classes, which I've taught for quite a few years now. And uh, over this period of time, it's become uh, at least a thesis of mine that uh, the author of Luke Acts uh, 
is writing about uh, a profound hope that is expected, uh, but that is also threatened. And I think one way we can read these two books uh, is with this uh, topic of hope in mind and see how that is a narrative thread, at least implicitly, throughout the whole work. Uh, what does that mean? Um, well, if you think of these two works, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, these are written by the same author. They somehow got separated in our canonical arrangement, but they belong together. Uh, you have the gospel, then you have a sequel. Uh, the gospel starts with two chapters that emphasize uh, the hope of the redemption of Israel uh, in the Jerusalem temple. Uh, and I start my essay, I titled my essay, with a, with a phrase from the uh, Resurrection Day encounter that Luke recounts on the Emmaus Road. Uh, and the characters there before knowing uh, who they're talking to, the incognito Jesus, uh, say we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Uh, so there's a, there's a thematic that goes through this book uh, that this is the main topic, the redemption of Israel. Uh, of course, when you get to Acts 28, uh, you have uh, a rather stern uh, picture of Paul telling the Jews, well, you're rejecting the message, so we're going to go to the Gentiles. So it's been a standard Christian reading to say that uh, basically uh, the Christian church is born and, and the Jews are pushed off to the side, and, and, and that's that. We, we know this in its worst forms as a supersessionistic view of, uh, the sal uh, of salvation history. Uh, what I argue in this essay is that if you pay attention to various indications in the text, you find out that uh, there, are, there are many uh, uh, contrary indications built into the text that should disrupt this kind of a reading and uh, make it possible to see that when you get to Acts 28, something else is really going on, something else is happening. Uh, what are some of these indications? Uh, one of the principal ones uh, we find uh, in uh, Luke chapter 7, uh, we have the story of the uh, centurion in Capernaum, and uh, you know he, he has an, uh, a servant or a slave who's ill. He asks Jesus to heal this person, but he doesn't do it directly. He asks for intervention. And who intervenes for him? Uh, it's the elders of the Jews. And when they, when they approach Jesus, they say, not only should you do this for him, but, but he, he loves our country. He built our synagogue. Now, this is a very bizarre kind of thing to occur in this particular text. And if you're working uh, with a synopsis of the Gospels, which allows you to compare it with the other accounts in Matthew's Gospel, there's no mention of Jewish elders there. There's no mention of a synagogue. So you begin to ask yourself, what's going on? In uh, early chapters in Acts, uh, in the summary in chapter 6, verse 7, the narrator of uh, the text tells us that uh, many priests were becoming faithful to the word and believing. Yeah, these would be Jewish priests. Uh, when Paul gets to Jerusalem in, uh, in chapter uh, 21, he meets with James, who at this point is the, uh, the leader of the Jerusalem church, and James tells Paul, see how many thousands of the Jews are faithful believers. And again, I would say historically, this is rather hyperbolic. You begin to see that something's going on in these texts. The author is provoking you to see something and to uh, uh, find out how is it that uh, what we call Christians and Jews, how is it that they actually belong together? Uh, and that salvation is actually something, the, the, the hope of salvation is God is, is going to save Israel plus the nations. Uh, this is further worked out when we look in Acts chapter, chapters 10 and 11, where Luke presents the mm -hmm. ideal portrait of the first Gentile conversion. Who is this Gentile? It's another Roman centurion. Uh, it reminds us, of course, of the centurion in Luke 7. This is hardly accidental. Um, so again, we have this, this combination of Jew and non-Jew, in fact, non-Jew Roman, which at this period of time, that's a, that's a pretty volatile combination. So these, these things should, should kind of shock you into realizing what's going on. How does the narrator describe this centurion? He, uh, 
he's, he's, uh, he's a centurion who prays and gives alms. That is to say, that's just the narrator's way of telling you he practices Jewish piety. Um, as you continue to explore uh, uh, Luke Acts, you see uh, additional uh, uh, indications that suggest that this author's project um, is not only to uh, bring these characters together in his narrative, which he's obviously doing, but I think if we use a little imagination and uh, look at these texts and ask ourselves why are they formed in this way, we can come up with a hypothesis that says in this early Christian community that the author we call Luke writes for, actual Gentile believers and Jewish believers were in the same community trying to find their way. Uh, I, I subtitle my essay, The Fragility of Hope, and the point is, this is a very difficult thing to do. Not only do you have uh, the tension uh, uh, between uh, Jew and non-Jew, but you also have tensions uh, with, with what does it mean to be a believer, a follower of Jesus, early in, the, in this period of the Roman Empire. So you have all kinds of tensions. And what you seem to have is an author who brings the early Christian tradition available to him that had been around, and he reshapes it into a message that my argument is it actually goes from the beginning of Luke to the end of Acts to fortify this group uh, and show it the way, show it that it can survive and be a basically multi-ethnic, ethnic, uh, diverse group of religious people who can uh, basically uh, form a community. Uh, and one of the things that I found uh, most interesting, our, our editors tasked us as we were, I think, in the, in the revision period with relating our essays to other essays in the book. Uh, and two, that, that's two examples that I found that struck me uh, immediately were uh, a, a mention that uh, Richard Lennon makes in his essay about the church works out its hope in concrete concrete history, and then uh, uh, Tom Massaro's uh, comment that uh, hope uh, takes place in the context of social relations. So my argument is that uh, in, in this analysis of uh, Luke and Acts that I'm putting forward, all that is happening. We're, we're actually, the gospel and Acts are formulated on the basis of a, of a concrete group that existed that was working out its so its social relationship in a very tense environment. And, it, and it's fragile. We really don't know what happened at some point down the road. Uh, but this group uh, saw possibilities. It, it, it saw hope. And I think that the author, when the author broaches the question, you know, we, we thought he was the one to redeem Israel in the Emmaus Road. And then the, the end of Luke 24 basically says, well, you were right. He, he is. Uh, and then what, what that redeemed Israel is, though, it's not somehow shifting off the Jews over here and, and forming a new road. It's the two coming together. And, and you see this already formulated in the Oracle of Simeon in Luke 2.32 uh, at the, uh, the presentation of Jesus in the temple. He says, uh, a light of revelation for the Gentiles and glory for your people Israel. That's not light for revelation for the Gentiles and nothing for Israel. It's, it's something for both, light and glory. The two belong together. So, so our author argues for that. So uh, it was a, a great uh, pleasure for me to be able to finally uh, uh, document this reading anyhow and, and, and hope it, uh, it gets some acceptance. I think you can see it there uh, in the text and I've, I've tried to make the essay uh, approachable so it's, uh, it's easy to follow and, uh, and, and you can see the points. Uh, and uh, I, I've been... Uh, uh, now, now moving a little bit beyond it in another essay I've written trying to further make uh, observations on how, how close uh, followers of Jesus, uh, Jew, Gentile, are still in the first and second century that it can be very difficult to tell them apart. Well, thank you very much for your attention.
Hi, I, uh, the title of my uh, chapter, my essay is Hope for Creation. And um, maybe if you think about the last time that you uh, recited the creed at mass, this sort of, uh, to avoid that $50 word eschatology that my colleague already mentioned, you'll remember it without that word at the end of the creed because we talk about our hope in the world to come. And so for me, um, I really am intensely interested in the relationship between this world and the world to come because there are a lot of ways of, of imagining that relationship and I think some of them are closer to the heart of Christianity and Christian faith and, and other ones are not so close to it. Um, it's interesting that in a faith like ours that is based on belief in the incarnation of God that we seem to have so much ambivalence about being worldly. And we seem to have evoked in so many people throughout history the suspicion that we either are somewhat hostile to the world or afraid of becoming mere secular humanists maybe, or we're down, or we're just not interested in it ultimately. But it seems to me that if God created the world, it means that God is world-centered. Why else would God have created? And if, if the way we as Christians believe that, that God has most fully revealed God's self to us is in the incarnation, why would we have any doubt that this world as God's creation is something that is ultimately and eternally important to her. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of question and it's almost like a self-examination I felt when I was writing this. Just a, a few quick words, how did I sort of stumble on this? Like a lot of things in life, a lot of it depends maybe on what happens to you just by chance in your life, uh, very fortuitous um, elements. Uh, one of them was a wonderful man that I met when I first came to teach at Western Jesuit in Cambridge back in 1984, a Dutch Jesuit named Piet Sconenberg. And he wrote a wonderful book already right at the beginning of the 1960s. He was incidentally a real important force in a new approach to um, faith formation and catechetics. Also maybe the, one of the big writers behind, some of you are as old as I am, and if I mentioned the title of the Dutch Catechism around the time of the Second Vatican Council, you will recognize that. He wrote a book called God's World in the Making. I was riveted by that title. I was especially interested in the work that he was doing um, at the time I met him in the 80s on the Trinity, but this book remained a great fascination to me because we tend to think, I, I think, that God created in the beginning and it, that was sort of all done with and things were sort of rolling along. Unfortunately, they went south and so God had to uh, get into a redeeming mode or something like that. But this idea, God's world in the making, now this may sound funny, but do we have reason not just to be clever, but because it's at the heart of our faith to think of and imagine this world as God's work in progress? Because the Bible, when you spend a lot of time, and especially the Hebrew scriptures, make it so clear that God's Action is always creating something in order to save it from chaos. And as my colleague Dick Clifford says, uh, keeping the forces of chaos back, whether they're in a sinful people like you and me or whether they're in the forces of, of the cosmos, that's a full-time job and it never seems to be over. So this idea of thinking of the world as God's work in progress, it, it already makes me think that it's a lot more important than we usually give it credit for. 
And then there's the colleague I mentioned, Dick Clifford. He came to my office one day and said, uh, I'd really be interested in team teaching with you. Because one of the things is he's written about a lot as an Old Testament scholar is creation. And so we started doing that. And that developed, uh, gave the opportunity for me to think uh, and learn a lot from him and from our students about how closely related uh, what we believe about the beginning of the world and what we hope it's headed toward are so intimately related. And so it began to puzzle me why, if God has gone through so much trouble in creating and spends, as it were, so much time bringing this creation along, why is the, is the main way we think about our hope going to heaven? If I have nothing about going to heaven, and I'll say this in a, in a, in a serious way. In the last year and a half, um, both my parents died after a wonderful life. Uh, and so maybe there is a way in which our talk of heaven um, is a way of expressing our hope and uh, conviction that our faithful departed are still with us. But I'm still convinced that they, with all of the saints, are not off in some other place. Uh, they're with God. And if we believe that God is with us right now and engaged in our lives personally and cosmically, then they are too. Maybe they're just sort of waiting until the house that God is building, as it were, in this work in progress, until that house is finished, when, when it will be heaven. Now, if you're a little nervous about what I just said, there are, of course, a good number of reasons to be nervous, because a lot of people pop up in history who are convinced they have the recipe for bringing about heaven on earth. But that's not a good enough reason to dismiss entirely a possible grain of truth there, because after all, if you think about what the main message in the preaching and the, and the ministry of Jesus was, it was the announcement of the coming of God's kingdom. Not so much the fact that we're going to go somewhere when we die, and I just have tried in this essay and in my teaching and in also in my prayer to stick with that a little bit. And when you do, you begin to realize that Jesus doesn't really talk so much about heaven. He, he talks about things like the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God or as some people nicely translate it, the reign of God or the reign of heaven, by which he means that if God is coming to rule, it's because things need to be straightened out here. So the coming of the reign of God or the kingdom of heaven is a way of talking about how God wants the world to be, not only in the future, but now. And so then suddenly it might be clicking, you know, well, how did Jesus teach us to pray if the king of the universe a wonderful Jewish way of speaking about God, the one whose mighty, divine, creative power is ordering things so that all the creatures can flourish. This is what's going on in Genesis 1, for example. How does Jesus talk about this coming reign, this coming king, that God is finally going to bring this work in progress to its divinely desired fullness? How did he teach us to pray? We call it the Lord's Prayer, of course. And in that prayer, we don't so much pray to go to heaven, or let's say we pray to go to heaven in this way. We pray that God's kingdom may come and that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as a colleague of mine some, some years ago said, you know, when you hear words that are sort of strange, the kingdom of heaven, the reign of God, and so on, that's sort of like a code word for the way God wants the world 
she made to be. Unless you think that any one of us can, by our own efforts, make it that way, uh, we're totally mistaken. But we're equally mistaken uh, if we think that God wants to do it without our cooperation. So this leads me to think of those words that we say in the creed about our hope in the world to come, not as a replacement world, or not as another place that God is going to lead us toward, but it's what the vision of our faith when we look at Jesus enacting God's reign in his life, and when we want to become a part of that, we're imagining what God's power, his creative saving power, is going to let the world become, the world the coming world or the world to come is what God is, is making the world become. And so I try in, in this essay, as I do in my, just in my own theological reflections, to take seriously the, the possibility, which I think is more than the possibility, it's the heart of the gospel, that God does not come to save us from the world by taking us somewhere else. God comes to save the world from all of the forces of sin and death that threaten to destroy it. And it's not just about us. It's the world. That's the beautiful thing about St. Paul in Romans 8. Not the only place in the New Testament, but St. Paul has this cosmic vision that the world God wants to save isn't just human souls. It's not just human beings. It's all of the creatures. And it's all of the history, the history of our love, the fruits of our love, the fruits of our labor. It means what we're able to create. It means culture. All of this matters to God. If you're still skeptical about this, think of St. Paul in the epistle to the first epistle to the Corinthians, when he's trying to explain the center of Christian faith and its hope and its vision of the world by talking about the resurrection of the body. Now I admit Corinth was not what you'd call Boston or the Athens of the ancient world. It was a pretty slimy place. But he, St. Paul is obviously talking to some people who have a bit of an education. Why, I ask myself, does St. Paul going on about the resurrection of the body when the immortality of a soul would be such an easy sell if you had studied some Greek philosophy? And if you go back, if you go home and read chapter 15 of the first epistle to the Corinthians, you'll see that Paul gets uh, a lot of snide remarks about this faith in the resurrection of the body. How can it be? And yet the Gospels themselves talk about the witnesses of our ancestors in the faith seeing Jesus alive gloriously. The appearance stories. All of this, the resurrection of the Lord, should be a clue to us that we too have to imagine not just the passage of an immortal soul, but the transfiguration of this world in all of its materiality, in everything that we do. This is part of our hope for creation. Do we really believe that? That the whole cosmos and our history, all the fruits of our love and labor, as Gaudium et Spes says in chapter 39, that all of that matters eternally to God, and that God wants to transform and raise that up. Or as my, my colleague Dick Clifford said, 
Is all of our love and labor more or less like being given a cosmic sandbox to play in where the main point is not to throw sand at each other and if we behave ourselves, we will get to go into heaven? Or does what we do really matter that much to God? So I'll ask again, sort of in a cheeky way, which is harder to believe, do you think? That God is triune or that the world, and I mean the world, the whole cosmos, not just you and me, but all of the creatures, has an eternal destiny, which is harder to believe? Well, look out the window. I know why it's hard to believe a place like this has an eternal destiny. My colleagues have pointed out there's a dark underbelly to seeing what you can see out of the window and what you can see if you look inside yourself, too. But actually, these two doctrines are intimately related, the Trinity and the eternal destiny of the world. For they both hinge on the incarnation, that God has actually taken on flesh. So maybe as a little slogan, um, you've all heard, you know, you can't take it with you. It's true you can't take it with you. We can't take it with us. But God can. And God is determined to. God is determined to take all of what we do and all of God's creation into a share of God's life. So if you'll indulge me, not any more in my own words, but uh, in preparing and writing this uh, essay, I came across, again, a beautiful prayer that Karl Rahner uh, composed for hope. And um, I'll just read it, and uh, we might, it might be fitting to end this part of our presentation in a prayerful way. We ask you, God of grace and eternal life, to increase and strengthen hope in us. Give us this virtue of the strong, this power of the confident, this courage of the unshakable. May it always have a longing for you, the infinite, infinite plenitude of being. Make us always build on you and your fidelity. Always hold fast without despondency to your might. Make us to be of this mind and produce this attitude in us by your Holy Spirit. Then, O Lord our God, we shall have the virtue of hope. Then we can courageously set about the task of our lives again and again. Then we shall be animated by the joyful confidence that we are not working in vain. Strengthen your hope in us. Amen. And thank you. Well, thank you, Randy. Um, and thank you, Chris. Uh, we have a, a few more minutes. We'll, um, we wanted to have some, uh, an opportunity for you to respond. But even before we do that, there's a number of our colleagues who have contributed chapters to this book who are here present. So those who are here present who have a chapter uh, in the book, if you would just stand so that we could all acknowledge you. Um, so there's a number of them here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so we have an opportunity for some response, questions, um, any any reactions? If and and we'll 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 um, take about ten minutes or so for this. If you if you'd like to raise a question, make a comment. Sure, Tom. Oh, you know, I'm going to ask you, um, we're filming this, so we Thank need you. to use the mic. Oh, gee, I'll stand Sorry. up. We're filming. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, when we came together originally to, um, this is kind of an obvious comment, but when we, to construct these essays on hope, it, it wasn't an easy time for hope. Uh, and in some ways, uh, our church has changed dramatically. 
uh, since we first came together, apropos hope. And so it's just, it's a delightful, uh, you know, we were ahead of the curve, as far as yes, that. We were yes. ahead of the curve for hope. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Francis has really shaken things up a bit. Oh, thank you all for, um, oh, that is a live mic. Um, this is such an honor to hear about this project and to see it, uh, see it come to fruition because I know many of us who are students at the STM have heard a lot about this book and have been anticipating in hope for this book. And um, something that, that has struck me in looking around and seeing so many of us um, emerging theologians how is this book a practice of hope in terms of the collaboration um, that, that you were all involved in in producing it? I'd like to hear a few more reflections on that. Would you? Uh, how is it a practice of hope? That's a fabulous question. <laughs> they were writing about Pope and uh, instantiating it as well. Um, I think it's, it's a it was a practice in hope um, for many reasons. Certainly, I want to go back to one of the points that Chris made in his opening remarks, um, just the fact that we were all to coming together. And we, um, in groups of four, twice, we read one another's essays and uh, offered each other some feedback and critique and also support for various points. And the fact that we were doing that together uh, collaboratively, I think is a great sign of hope because we really were working together as, uh, as um, colleagues. And often we don't, uh, we don't always have the time necessarily to know one another's works and contributions. So I think that for me was a great sign of hope. And then to have a product like this that symbolizes the school itself, I also find very hopeful because this will be I think historically a significant um, a, a significant endeavor in the in the life history of the STM, and I'm also hopeful. I would say that there will be other similar projects into the future. I, I think a, a number of us have already started thinking about that. So I think on all those uh, counts, I, I think the project is a, a practice of hope. And I'm sure there may be others who may want to contribute to it. I don't know, Randy and Chris, if you have anything you want to say about how it was a practice of hope for, for you. Uh, just by coincidence, I was uh, with the uh, colloquium of students doing advanced master's degree. They were, we were talking about writing, and I was giving the example of how helpful it is to be a part of a group that um, helps one another to write. And maybe it's a little bit sometimes like um, the little boy in the gospel stories with the loaves and fishes who comes with only a few loaves and fishes and then sees how many people are being fed by it and is a bit amazed to say well but i that, where did that come from and that's a wonderful experience to go to have happen uh, because of the presence of colleagues who somehow mysteriously help more to come out of you than you may ever have dreamed possible. Uh, thanks for your presentation so far, and I look forward to the, to the book. And my question's not that different from Kat's, but it, it is a little different. Uh, since you had the opportunity to read one another's work and comment on it, I'm curious if you can recall any instances where somebody else is writing and thinking um, in their own essay caused you to kind of think new directions for yourself, whether it showed up in the book or not, or you're in your own essay or not, but I'm curious if there were instances of that among the three of you here. Um, to some degree, uh, uh, in, in our small group, uh, uh, Hoffman wrote about the uh, experience of uh, immigrants and uh, migration uh, and just a, a lot of the uh, realities of uh, current life uh, that he was able to bring out through that paper 
struck me uh, very existentially. So it wasn't a, wasn't what I was working on, uh, but um, uh, I appreciated the opportunity to see what he was doing with that. And uh, since that time, I've also noticed uh, in my own field of vehicle studies, people who've adopted that kind of a model, uh, maybe, perhaps not quite as well as he did, but uh, but uh, using it as a as a way to um, uh, get a different reading of, of biblical text. So, um, uh, you know, just echoing from the previous question, it was a, a good opportunity to be able to see what other folks are working on. Uh, often, I ha I spend very little time in these other disciplines these days. <laughs> it's very different than when you're early in your studies and you're all over the place. Uh, you know, things get so compartmentalized that. Um, uh, it's kind of refreshing to be able to, in a sense, have the luxury to watch several other projects uh, being formed that, that you don't know a whole lot about. So they become instructive and informative in various ways. So that was part of it, which I, I appreciated. Uh, just one thing, I mean, I, I would have thought of it less in terms of big uh, conversions of uh, points of view or something, but more of, a, of enrichment. But one thing does uh, uh, strike me in particular, how in a number of uh, contributions the point was made, which I think is true, is that um, hope is not just um, a gift in a certain way. I mean, I think that that's one of the things we do as church or just as friends that we nourish each other in hope, but it's also a choice. Um, it's something that you have to choose. It, it, and that's maybe more evident in some uh, situations in life than in others, but both promise or gift and choice, that was something that I found richly uh, developed in a number of the contributions. Yeah, I would echo that. I think uh, certainly Colleen's um, article, which launches the book, is on that very topic of, uh, of hope being both a choice and a gift. And I, I think that that echoed in a number of the essays. Certainly, uh, Andrea Vicini also developed that, that idea very profoundly. So I found that very rich. And I know reading, um, of course, as I was working through the, the question of tragedy, and certainly in the face of tragedy, there's a temptation to slip into despair. And, and part of what I was um, really grateful for in terms of thinking that through is that Dominic in his essay um, talked about both despair and the flip side of it, a, a certain presumption and an overconfidence that you know, we don't really need um, a God because things are going well and there's no real need for us to, uh, to, to, to cling to a, a, a Christian understanding of hope. And so to see the, the way that hope navigates uh, in, uh, in contrast to those both those negative um, dimensions in, in our lives that we see a, a sense of despair and then also uh, um, a presumption as well. So I think that was a, that was a very rich um, part of my, so I, there's many ways I think that we mentored one another in this. So thank you, that was a great question. Sure. Um, if you just wait a second for a mic. I liked very much the uh, integration and the synchronicity of the three of you working together and how you presented and shared that with us tonight. And um, I felt the scriptural basis using Luke for both the gospel of Luke and the Acts. And also the reality of our world, where there is a lot of tragedy and suffering, sorry. Okay. Um, and I love the emphasis also on the unfolding of God's creative world and our part in that, our participation and our collaboration. And I found myself thinking of two things. One was Deuteronomy 30, choose life and not death. And the other was earth hope alive. Thank you. If I could just follow up quickly on that, because uh, Tom Groom mentioned uh, our new pope. And since he's a Jesuit, <laughs> um, I find uh, this is, and since we're at a Jesuit university, I, I just find this so much uh, goes to the heart and soul of Ignatian spirituality. 
uh, after those of you who are familiar with the spiritual exercises in the last part of the spiritual exercises contemplation to, uh, of love and part of this anyway is uh, Ignatius suggests that we should consider how God is laboring in all things in all the creatures what a great idea and and in a certain way, that's the beauty about these kind of uh, uh, big um, symbols, let's say, but they can go in many different directions. But, but one of the directions is that if you want to see what divine love is like, it, it's something that is laboring. And one of the wonderful things about Ignatius, he was obviously a great lover of, of God, but it was... It wasn't so much a mysticism of union as it was a mysticism of service. Love in action, in other words. And uh, this, this contemplation is sort of twofold. It's, it's contemplating God, but then you have to contemplate the, the world. Why? Because that's what God is focusing on. So it's, it reminds us that we, in being God-centered, we have to be this-worldly. Not because it's a, like a secular bandwagonism, but it's because, that's, because God is the creator. That's what he is focused on. It's a little Jesuit plug there. <laughs> okay, yes, Andrea? Um, maybe somebody could. Thank you for your presentation. I was thinking you mentioned a few of uh, the contributors. Might be interesting for uh, all of us here uh, particularly those who didn't work in writing the book, just to have a, a brief I idea of uh, what the other contributors are writing on, uh, what they bring to the book. So sure. the one you didn't mention, it might be interesting. I hope you don't mind doing that. No, absolutely. So, um, well, I wonder if we might even have, uh, we could just go around and have you, those that are present, mention a bit about their own, their own chapters. So would you... Um, Share. Would you go ahead, um, Andrea or Francine? Okay. <laughs> I trapped myself. <laughs> <laughs> but you already said that I, I was attracted in reflecting on hope uh, as something that characterizes our moral life. And I like the idea of hope springing in us like a source, uh, both in terms of a gift and choice and trying to apply it to a concrete issue that is uh, sustainability, so the ecological concerns, and see how hope can help us going beyond despair when we think about the way in which we should or we need to protect our planet. Francine. I was going to say that I'm hoping for cake, so that <laughs> <laughs> I want to make this short and hope we can all make this short. Um, I wrote about hope for history, and um, talked about the, the same tension Randy was talking about, but in a different context of um, social justice, hope for history now, the vocation of women religious. I start and end with LCWR, um, and Gaddy Mitzpez as hope for the church and the world, if we can reappropriate it and, can, and carry it forward beyond its first initial uh, efforts at grappling with this issue 50 years ago. If you want to come up, Dominic is here up at the front. Thank you. Uh, I wrote a, just a brief essay describing <clears throat> Aquinas's definition of hope as the desire for a future difficult yet possible good, and then compared it with the uh, flanking theological virtues of faith and charity. Aqu Aquinas puts it very succinctly. Faith shows the goal, hope moves us towards the goal, and charity unites us with the goal. And then I had a bit on despair and presumption as well, just to make it more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Colleen and, uh, well, yeah, I want Colleen and, uh, who am I? Um, I developed the oh, thesis uh, that um, hope is both a gift and a choice and was very interested in this essay in um, what the practice of hope might look like. My essay, I called it, Is There Hope for Faith? Because as Dominic says, Aquinas laid it out, and we've always accepted that faith leads to hope, which leads to love. 
But I suppose in our day and age, uh, I found myself, as, especially as a religious educator, asking the question, is there not so much is there faith for a ho do we have the faith for hope, but do we have the hope for faith? Uh, and with people identify to the 30 million people in this country identifying themselves as former Catholics, just to cite one statistic, it's, it's a pressing question. Is there hope for faith in our time? And that's what I meant earlier when I said, uh, we wrote it in more dismal days, things are looking better. <laughs> and Christopher Frechette. Um. I wrote on the concept of the fear of the Lord, but to try to help from the perspective of an Old Testament scholar to understand that really talks about primarily worship and that in the ancient world, worship was always very engaged of the emotions and the affect. And it it's about, has to do with hope because if you think about it, when you, when you uh, have a sense of hope, it's because what you desire is attainable. But when things aren't attainable, when you're invested in something and you can't have it, then that's difficult. But what, what uh, I try to show in, in my essay is how to be invested in liturgy helps us to, uh, to be, have our emotional investment in our relationship with God, which is uh, what then can sustain us when we lose the things or need to lose the things that, that, that uh, we're otherwise invested in. It helps us to navigate those waters between uh, having a lot of emotional investment and stuff that's difficult and then being able to uh, to navigate through those things, to be able to attach to other things which are more possible because of our grounding in our relationship with God. Thank you. And I'm going to let um, Richard have the last word, but before I, we move to Richard, is there someone else here that I missed that is a contributor? Did I miss somebody? No, I guess I don't think so. So why don't we conclude? Um, Richard uh, can say a bit about his chapter, and, and then we'll go ahead and, and conclude there, there. My chapter is called The Church, Got Hope? Question uh, mark. <laughs> with thanks to Francine who suggested that title to me. Uh, <laughs> What I was interested in, in, in asking is not so much whether individual Christians can be people of hope, because I think there's no doubt about that, but whether the church taken collectively is the source of hope for our world. Uh, standing back and thinking about it, we'd want to say that as related to God's revelation in Christ and the Spirit, hope must be part of the church's DNA, but that's not necessarily what we experience in history. So what, what is required to have a hope-filled and hopeful church? A and I, I do it through the lens of considering what we say about the church and the creed. Uh, church is the only thing that gets into the creed apart from God. So it must matter. And we say in the creed that the church is one, holy, Catholic and apostolic. So what are the implications of those four terms for the conversion of each of us as people of the church leading to the church as being uh, the, the locus for the practice of hope. Thank you. And the last, last word, Mark, please. Please join me in thanking Nancy, Richard, Chris, and Randy, and all the contributors who are here tonight for bringing all of this great project to fruition. So congratulations to all, to all of you. <laughs>